Thank you so much for joining us for LS Online. We're grateful that you're taking the time to stay caught up with the sermon series currently being taught at Living Stones Church in Elko, Nevada. Although we're honored to be able to provide this online content, we want to make clear that this is not to replace your personal involvement in a local church in any way. So please use this service when you need to, but make it a priority to get plugged into a local gospel preaching church where you can worship, serve, and give as soon as possible. God bless you. Now please enjoy. All right, if you're out in the foyer, go ahead and make your way in. We're going to get started this morning. Good morning, church. It's good to be with you. If you're willing and able, please stand as we sing. Call to worship is from Psalm 40. May all who seek you rejoice. May those who love your salvation say, great is the Lord. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord has taken thought of me. We rejoice because our God has taken thought of us this morning. He hears our prayers. He hears our song. And so we sing out. It's pouring, it's pouring now 
Moving Stones. How are you guys? Good morning. It is good to see everybody. It's good to be with you guys today. Uh, if you're new and visiting our church, uh, we are just really excited that you're here. Uh, really excited and honored that you would join us today. This morning, we're going to sing songs of praise to Jesus. We're going to hear a sermon or a message preached over us to help us kind of navigate what our God has said through his word, the Bible. And we're going to get to experience the good as a family that comes from taking time from our schedules to remember that God is good, that Jesus has come for us, and that there is hope in Jesus's life, death, and resurrection. Amen? One of my favorite authors, Paul David Tripp, says this about worshiping God on Sundays. He says, corporate worship is designed to give you hope in the hardships of life as it reminds you that your Lord is with you in faithfulness, power, wisdom, and grace. Family and new friends, uh, this is my prayer for you all today, that in your hardships, this time would point you to Jesus and remind you that God is with you always. If you are new to Living Stones, I want to encourage you. Uh, we do uh, kind of the a text thing here at Living Stones because this is the 21st century and we like to text apparently. So if you'd like to stay up to date with what's going on at Living Stones, you can text the word welcome to the number on the screen behind me. Uh, we're not going to bombard your phone uh, about once or twice a week at most. We're just going to let you know what's going on so that you don't miss out on anything. This is a great way to just keep in touch with our church. For those of you who use this, feel free to use that number at any time. You've got questions, if you've got thoughts, if if you want to join a community group, you can just text that to that phone number and we're going to get back to you with that stuff. So I'm going to pray for us all. Uh, and then, oh wait, one more thing. If you're new to Living Stones, I'm sorry, 1245 today, we've got starting point class. Uh, that's an opportunity to hear more about what Living Stones is about, how you can get plugged in. You can meet a pastor. Uh, you can just find out all about Living Stones at starting point today uh, after the 11 a.m. service at 1245. Now, I'm going to pray for us and we're going to continue in worship. So if you guys would bow your heads with me. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come into your presence and to just worship you. God, we ask that you would be glorified in everything that we do today. God, we ask that you would move mightily with your spirit. God, that you would fill this room with your presence in a powerful, palpable way. God, and that each one of us uh, would be reminded of the goodness of your grace and mercy to us. God, be with us as we worship today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, before we get back to worship, we've taken an opportunity to acknowledge that we're in the presence of God. So we want to make sure that we acknowledge we're in the presence of one another. So if you would turn to somebody you know or somebody you don't know, welcome them to Living Stones this morning. and make your way back to your seats. Remain standing. We're going to sing.
Thessalonians says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all things, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. We're going to sing a new song called Rejoice. We lift our voices for what our God has done in his life, death, and resurrection. Let's sing this out. we come before you and we're grateful and thankful that you have gone before us, that you are good and that you are kind, that you know the things that we deal with. I'm thankful that we can come into a place like this and and rejoice because of your life, death, and resurrection. Give us strength now in this time. Help us to hear from your word. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. amen. You guys can be seated. All right. We have just a couple of announcements and we've got one special announcement for you this morning that I'm really excited about. But before we get to that, uh, what we want you guys to know is that next week on November 20th, we're celebrating Baptism Sunday. Yeah. Those people over here know how we do Baptism Sunday. If you heard all of that cheering, we party on Baptism Sunday because there is nothing better than seeing people give their lives to Jesus. Amen. That's what we live for here at Living Stones is to see new people whose lives have been wrecked and changed by the gospel. And so what we want to do is we want to celebrate hard. So grab your friends, grab your family, grab everyone and come out next Sunday, 9 and 11, uh, to celebrate what God is doing in the life of our church and in the lives of those 15 people so far who are being baptized. And that'll be 45 people this year who have trusted in Jesus, who are celebrating baptism. God, man, 
we, I don't think you guys understand how blessed we are to be a church that gets to see 45 people trust in Jesus in the same year. That is incredible. In my entire life growing up in various churches, I don't think I saw that many baptisms in over 20 years. Do you have any idea the incredible work God is doing in our church? It is freaking phenomenal. Sorry, I got choked up about this because this just doesn't happen. So I just want to remind you guys, come next Sunday. Uh, if you're interested in being baptized, maybe you're curious, maybe you get to watch that and something is stirred in your heart. We have a baptism class that'll happen right after the 11 a.m. service. Hang out for that. It's going to be a great opportunity to hear about baptism, what it is, what it's not, and why you should be baptized as a believer in Jesus. We cannot wait to celebrate next week with you guys. We cannot wait to see what God continues to do in the life of our church. Now, we've got a special announcement for you this morning. Uh, we have actually a couple of guests from the Reno Church, uh, Josh and Whitney Legrone, if you guys would come up here. Uh, these two are leading, yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> These two are leading LS at the U, which is the college ministry arm of Livingstone's churches. And they have some cool stuff that they want to talk to you about. So if you guys would give them your, your rapt attention. Thanks, guys. And go for it. Uh, there we are. Uh, good morning, Elko. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, we've been looking forward to this trip for a long time, specifically me, because Elko is my hometown. Um, woo! Um, I love being back here. Um, I grew up here. I graduated from Spring Creek High School. Uh, my parents go here and my sisters. And so you guys just have a piece of my heart. And so um, love to be here. Um, so with that, the, you guys' bab that baptism thing that you were just talking about, I'm just like so moved by it. I kind of feel like we should come back next weekend to watch because <laughs> that's amazing. Um, so pastors, leaders to this church, um, you guys are doing awesome things, and we hear about it in, in Reno all the time. Um, so thank you. Good job. Thank you for loving on my family, and thank you for loving on this city. Um, so quick story, real quick. Um, I graduated high school, went to Reno to go to college, heard about a church that had mainly college students, went right away, and I ended up going to Livingstone's Reno my entire um, student years. Um, it was there that I found a community of other college students and um, that were also looking to grow their faith, something I had never seen before. I also was, um, leaders took hold of me and they didn't let me go, which was something else that I had never experienced before. And they walked with me through all the ups and downs of college, all of my good decisions, all of my bad decisions, and it transformed my faith. Um, knowing Christ became a real thing to me there. And I think I can, I'm one of many that has been touched by that, co that college ministry at that time. And um, it changed my life. Um, so now here I am with my husband, Josh, who had a, has a really similar story um, in college, but now we are full-time missionaries on... Um, University of Nevada, Reno. So with that, she's a hometown hero. I'm from San Diego, so I come from a way different place. <laughs> way different. Um, but as she said, we are missionaries. And just as Jesus says, and he prays in the book of John, Father, just as you have sent me, I now send them. We're the sent. Okay, Everybody here is here because somebody told them about the goodness of living souls, Elko. And that's what we're doing on campus. We got a beautiful campus, a fishbowl of 20,000 students who their main priority is status, a job, a career, whatever it may be. But we're there to present Jesus to them. So with your help, we want to see that done. But we did that by giving up a lot. Um, up until the summer of this year, we owned a gym. We sold that gym to be full-time missionaries. Um, and we take support through donations. We take support through prayer. I would love to hang out and talk to you guys after service if you're available to come and meet with me, talk with us, see really what we're doing on campus. Um, and just a quick story. We had a young man come into our, to our, one of our community groups on campus. All of our groups meet on campus. This young man at the end of our service broke down in tears and said, I don't know Christ. I've never been to church, but I saw a post about this. And because of that, I'm here. He went on to tell us his mom is struggling with blood clots. His father is dying and his brother had to drop out of school to help support the family. We pray for that young man. He is now a believer. 
he now comes to church faithfully. And because of that, the work of God is moving. So please, 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 if you've got anything within you that wants to be a part of seeing the next generation flow through Elko, flow through Reno, Carson, the whole Northern Nevada climate, please take some time, scan this QR code, see what it is we do, and we would love to meet with you after service. Thank you. I think it's really important to acknowledge uh, I would not be here if not for Living Stones' ministry on the university campus. That's just the reality. There are so many people whose lives have been touched by that. Uh, if you want to throw that slide back on real quick for me, the last one, uh, I'd highly encourage you at least snap a picture of that. If God leads you in the next near future uh, to give and to be generous towards that ministry, uh, we would definitely appreciate that. Uh, if this isn't the right time for you, at any point, you can text that number 312-8887 uh, and you can let us know your interested in giving to Ellis at the U, and we will hook you up with this QR code again. We want to make sure that we continue to fund the mission of the gospel going out wherever that is, and especially in our own state and on the university campus. Thank you guys so much. Uh, a couple, like, this is a housekeeping thing. My next announcement, which was not planned, so there's no slide for it, guys, sorry. Um, so, Something you guys should know is that last week we celebrated uh, one of the largest attended Sundays at Living Stones Church, Elko. <clears throat> Over 600 people were here last week to celebrate uh, and to hear about the good news uh, that Jesus saves. But there's something that's got to happen because of this, okay? And, and here's what that is. If you're in here and you're a member of Living Stones Church, you're a covenant member, that sort of thing. I know we all have our seats that we like. I, I know we love our comfort and we love to come in and just get to sit in that nice little spot. But here's the deal. What's really happening is there are many new people coming to hear about Jesus and they need a seat. And so if you guys would, would you step out of your comfort zone when you see that happen? It's a small room. You can see them come in the door. Would you consider filling those seats next to you between you and somebody else to make more room for people to come here? Would you do that? All I'm asking is, yeah, all I'm asking is that you scoot in when you see somebody coming in and give them a seat because we want them to be able to hear the good news. Amen. There are lots of information coming about our plans for the future to make sure that there continues to be space here at Living Stones. Uh, but for now, that's my ask of you is just make sure that we're making room for people, that we're not being selfish, that we're saying, get in here. We want you to hear about Jesus. Amen? Amen. All right. Thank you guys so much for that. Now we're going to read God's word together. So if you would grab your Bible or you can grab one of these black Bibles that are placed in the seats around the room and you can stand for the reading of God's word. This morning, we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, if you're using one of those black Bibles from the seats around you, that's going to be on page 933. Uh, if you're using a Spanish translation Bible, that'll be on page 1647. We're going to be in 1 Timothy, Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. If you're curious, uh, maybe you're new and you're wondering why we're standing. Uh, we believe that God has revealed himself to us through his word. And so we stand out of reverence for that because that was not something that he had to do, but he has given us this. And so we stand in reverence of it. Timothy, first Timothy chapter three, verse eight, would you follow along with me? It says this deacons likewise must be dignified, not double tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Would you guys pray with me? God, we ask that you would speak to us this morning through your word. And we ask that you would give Pastor Nathan the words to speak to us, that you, he would preach those words in boldness and in clarity. And God, I ask for open hearts, minds, and ears to hear what you have for us today. God, we're so grateful that you've given your word to us. Thank you that we get to take the opportunity to worship you through listening to it preached. God, be with us today. Be with Pastor Nathan today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat, guys.
Good morning, Living Stones. It's good to be with you guys this morning. Uh, if you're new or you're visiting, I, I've met some of you already, but uh, my name is Nathan Hornback, and I'm the lead pastor for Living Stones here in Elko, and I'm just so thankful uh, that all of you guys came in here this morning. You know, I, I know it's freezing. It would have been uh, pretty tempting to just pull the covers up a little closer, you know, start your coffee maker from your phone and, uh, and just chill. And the fact that you guys uh, chose to come here, we don't take that for granted. That's what I'm saying. Thank you for gathering to worship Christ. Um, before I dive in, uh, I, I want to say something and I'm, <sighs> I, I don't know if I have any tears left. I'm going to try to hold it, hold it together. But, uh, this past week, we lost uh, a member of our church. Uh, you guys know him. Uh, his name was, even if you never met him, you know him. His name was John. Uh, he was a special needs man. He always sat right here. He was really loud. Even during the sermon, he made a bunch of noise. Uh, he took 45 minutes to make one cup of coffee, and we all loved him for it. And uh, he was a faithful part of our church. His hand would be the first hand to the sky when the band started playing. Last week, we were wondering where he was. We're like, it's weird that John isn't here. Where's John at? And come to find out he had passed away in his apartment. And uh, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I am so proud to have pastored a church that loved John. I never saw anybody treat him poorly. I never saw anybody tell him to be quiet. I know that during greeting, instead of just stepping out here, he would go that way <laughs> past all of the people. And everybody was so gracious to him. Several of you bought him shoes when you saw he came in and his shoes were falling apart. I come in for a Sunday morning and I look and I can't even remember who it was, but somebody was giving him a brand new pair of shoes. I just want to say thank you for caring for John. Uh, I'm going to miss him a lot. It's going to be way too quiet up in here now. Y'all better step up, okay? Because I know some of those noises he was making were some amens in his own way, and I'm going to miss that. Um, but my wife told me something one day, and I'm just going to share this, and then I'll be done. She said, we were talking about John, and she goes, you know what's going to be amazing, Nate? And I said, what? And she goes, one day, John's going to be with Jesus, and his body and his mind are going to be whole again. And she goes, one day, we're going to see him, and he's going to walk up, and he's going to go, hey, Pastor Nathan. You know, and I just, like, she didn't, even, couldn't, I, she didn't even say anything more because I was already done. <laughs> and I just, I'm so thankful for Jesus. I'm so thankful that John is with Jesus, that his hands are up in a whole new way as he worships the Lord today. And so family, thank you for loving John. Uh, I wanna be a church that can love anybody right where they are. Thank you for treating him with kindness. Thank you for giving him understanding. Thank you for waiting so long for a cup of coffee. I'm really gonna miss John and I know many of you will too, but thank you. It means a lot to me and to the leaders of our church. All right, shift gears. Um, Ah, okay, all right. Guys, thank you. It's really good to have you this morning, for real. I didn't mean to start us on such a low note, but I just think it's worth celebrating a brother who went to see Jesus. Um, but it's good to have you guys here. We're, we are continuing this morning uh, in our sermon series called The Church. And uh, this week and last week, uh, as you can tell by the scripture we just read, we're talking about church leadership. And uh, it's interesting because when I was talking about this section of scripture with a friend this week, uh, he asked me, he's like, how do you preach a text like that? Uh, he's, and he was like, it, it seems like it's just a bunch of information and, and like a list of qualifications. He was like, how do you preach the gospel from that? And uh, I was just talking with him. And I said, that's a great question. But uh, of course, family, we remind ourselves that every single word of this book is in fact pointing us to Jesus. Amen every word of it. And therefore, every passage of scripture gets us to Jesus in one way or another, including this very informative one, okay? Uh, in fact, I would argue that this section on deacons and the one from last week on elders that Pastor Eric preached so well, they are critical for us to know and understand as we pursue Christ together as a church family. And here's the reason why. 
Because in order for us, church, to effectively answer the questions that our culture and the world is asking about the church and about the gospel, questions of its irrelevance or danger or necessity, we have to understand where a lot of their questions actually come from, right? We have to understand. And so we need to see that as they look at the global church and the local church and engage with it, some of their issues, and rightly so, come from the people within the church, right? Specifically, the leaders of the church. And this makes sense. I mean, it it might hurt our pride a little bit to hear that, that we all have issues, but we do, right? And the reason is because the church is filled with a bunch of imperfect people who were all sinners, right? You with me on this? John would have said amen by now, family. Come on. (laughs) What are we doing? We all, all of us, right? We make mistakes all the time, don't we? And yet even still, even though we can acknowledge that, something remains true that we need to discuss as we look into these, the questions that our culture asks. And, And it's this, it's the main point of my sermon. I'll put it on the screen for you. We need to realize that the credibility of a church is determined by the character and integrity of its leadership. The credibility of a church is determined by the character and integrity of its leadership. Uh, And every pastor of every church that I've ever talked to, yeah, has a desire in one way or another uh, that their church family would grow every pastor I've ever talked to is praying that God would grow their church. Okay. Now it's not simply because they want to report numbers or be a part of some numbers club that doesn't matter. Okay. At least not the pastors that I've talked to, but, but if you know the heart of a pastor, or if you were here to ask any of our staff or deacons or ministry heads at all, you would find very quickly that the only reason we pursue this calling and service to God in ministry is is one reason. And it's because the gospel of Jesus Christ has changed our lives. That's the reason. It's because we're going off of something that has been really done for us by a real and living God. And God has given us a burden for our community and for the world at large that we cannot ignore. We want as many people as possible to hear the good news of Jesus and believe in him. And then together through the power and the strength and influence that comes when people gather together, lifting up Christ, we then in Jesus name and for Jesus's glory, want to serve and love our communities in the world. Isn't that the goal? That's why we're here. We want to, because of Christ, affect change and bring justice and hope and healing and redemption and joy and peace to all we come into contact with. That's the goal of everything that we do. We want Jesus's name, not our name, to be on the lips of as many people as possible before we're dead and gone. That's the reason we've given our lives to this. It's the motivation for all we do and all we strive for. That's Josh and Whitney's motivation for LS at the U. They want as many people as possible to know our Jesus. And yet, family, if that's the goal, and it's a great and noble and true and right goal, then what this passage on church leadership speaks of is absolutely true. Listen, if the leadership are not men and women of character and integrity, walking with Christ, men and women of the word and of humility and repentance, if that's not true of us, then the church loses its credibility in part to affect that change then the message that we proclaim even loses its power in the ears of the hearer because they aren't connecting the message of gospel, hope, and change with a changed life by the gospel. You following me? Here's an example maybe of how this is happening in the world today. Um, There's a relatively new form. Maybe it's not new. There's a relatively uh, more common form now of entertainment that our culture enjoys. And, uh, and I'm talking about the public entertainment that the failure of pastors and church leaders has become. Public entertainment. Today, the sins and failures of churches and leaders are not just something you hear about and think on for a second. They're turned into movies and podcasts and HBO Max specials. 
ready for streaming around the globe, ready for people to be entertained by, encouraged to form judgments against these people and all these things with honestly from our living rooms, little regard as to what's actually true and not just assumed. And I'm just trying to tell you that that does a lot of damage. And as I see these things, not to mention, I think there's little to no concern for what their families, what their children must be going through. As the world streams the sins of their family online and people are just chilling with popcorn. I'm not a fan of this at all. And here's why. Because apart from the grace of God family, that could be me that you're watching. Apart from God's grace, that could be me. That could easily be Pastor Seth, Pastor Garrett, Pastor Eric, Pastor Carter, or any of our leaders. Apart from God's grace, that's us. And I would never wish anyone to go through that. Sin destroys lives and hurts people, and it's not entertainment. And yet I know maybe, maybe, I'm going to be honest, maybe the more bold of you in the room would say, well, I don't know, Pastor Nathan, I think it's good that sin is exposed and that they're exposed for what they are, and and that they're corrected, and that there's punishment for their sin. I think that's a good thing. To which I would say, in some part, of course, sin should be exposed and corrected, and it has consequences, yes and amen. But but follow me. I'm just saying that I'm not sure that the trend of rejoicing and being entertained at the downfall and destruction of other sinners just because they sin differently than you or me is actually helpful. That's all I'm saying. And yet even still, God does hold the leadership in his church to a higher standard. The credibility of his church is determined in part by the character and integrity of its leaders. I mean, notice what the scripture says. We just read it together. The word of God through these verses calls leaders in the church to be men and women who walk with God, who pursue spiritual disciplines, who strive to have certain things be true about them as they follow and teach others about Jesus. Of course, all the while knowing and remembering that we ourselves are not Jesus, (laughs) right? We can't be. And so much like Pastor Eric said last week, the call of the scripture here is to faithfulness and humility. It's not to perfection. Why? Well, because it's not possible, right? (laughs) Because there aren't any perfect people. None of your pastors are perfect. None of our deacons are perfect. None of our members are perfect. None of you sitting in this room are perfect. There was only ever one perfect person and he gave his perfect sinless life as a sacrifice for us. He shed his innocent blood so that our sinfulness could be covered in amazing grace. See family, we haven't even gotten into the line by line text yet and we're already talking about Jesus because he's everything. He's our everything. And listen, for the sake of him and for the sake of his glory in the world, in our city, and in our own lives, if we want this family of Living Stones Church in Elko, Nevada to endure the test of time, if we want to see gospel change in our community in powerful ways, then it starts with we as elders and deacons and even you as members, just Christians. It starts by us recognizing the need to be men and women of integrity and character. We all need to be, because of the Holy Spirit within us, the first to own our weaknesses. The first to own our need for grace and mercy and the first to actually turn from our sin and turn toward Jesus and desire to look more like him. It's got to start with us. All of this so the world and our city through us will see Jesus not as they think he is, but as he really is filled with mercy and grace and forgiveness and love and a God who is at work in us, changing us daily to look more like his son, the Lord Jesus. And so what I wanna do, family, is I wanna dive into this passage and I just wanna move through these things that, that Paul tells Timothy need to be true of leaders in God's church, particularly deacons. And I wanna kind of unpack that, okay? So if you would look in your Bibles, I wanna read one more time, verses eight through 13. You can just follow along as I read. Paul says to Timothy, he says, Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. 
they must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. And so really quick, what you need to know is that deacons were first created in Acts chapter 6 uh, when the elders saw that care for the people of God became far too much for just the few of them to handle. Okay, And so what these elders did was they appointed faithful men and women to serve on behalf of and alongside of the elders in more task-oriented roles uh, so that God's people would be cared for. Um, If you read it, it's clearly set up where the elders God called to devote themselves to teaching and prayer and preaching and the spiritual tasks that were needed to care for God's people. And deacons then would serve by being more hands-on with the people, particularly feeding the people and meeting the needs that these, these groups would have as the early church, okay? And so even so, what we see is that deacons are critical for the life of the church. And I want you guys to know that deacons are leaders in the church, like the elders are, just with a different role and with different authority, Okay? And yet, Scripture calls deacons who serve practically as the hands and feet of Jesus to also be men and women of character and integrity for the sake of the gospel and the glory of God. Okay? And so right away here, we see that Paul lists a few additional qualifications that are not to be heard apart from the things that he mentioned above and said must be true of elders, but are to be heard in the same context of the importance of who leads in God's church. Okay. And so he lists nine qualifications that need to be true of deacons or leaders in God's church. And I'll put them on the screen and I'm just going to leave them up there uh, as I move through these for you. They're right there in your Bibles. He says first that they need to be dignified, which just simply means they need to be honorable. They need to be respectable. I can't be somebody that you just have no respect for. That's not a, that's not a good thing. He says they need to not be people who are double tongued. What's that mean? That's not something we say a lot, right? Well, people who are double tongued are people who say one thing to certain people, but then say something completely different to other people. You ever met somebody like this? Or they say one thing, but they mean something else. Ever met somebody like that? Is it you? <laughs> the reason I say that, family, is we need to be real careful. I know that there's a tendency here for us to just be thinking about everybody else. We also need to see, are any of these things true of us? Humility starts right here, right? And so if you find yourself tempted to go, oh, double-tongued, I got a list of some bros who are double-tongued, that would not be a great thing to do, okay? So as you hear this, humble your own heart and ask God if these things are true of you, that we might address them. Somebody who's double tongue, simply put, their words can't be trusted, so they're not qualified to lead. As simple as that. Paul goes on and says they can't be addicted to much wine. I mean, this is simple. Like if you're addicted to alcohol or strong drink of any kind, if it overtakes you easily, if you cannot drink without getting drunk, then according to the scriptures, you lack self-control. You're undisciplined and cannot serve as a deacon or leader in God's church. It's not, you know, this isn't Paul or the word of God trying to put us down or make fun of those of us who may, who may struggle with that. He's just simply saying that deacons or leaders in God's church cannot be slaves to anything but Christ. It's just, it's just as simple as that, right? And not only that, I want to say deacon or not, if you're a slave to alcohol, you need to get free from that stuff. You need to get free. Like I know, listen, your enjoyment or your relaxation or your escape or whatever you would use to try and defend getting hammered all the time is not worth you sacrificing the control of the spirit of God in your life. It's not worth it, family. It will lead you to destruction. 
In fact, many men and women I've talked to over the last decade have lost their families. They've lost their livelihoods because in part of the role that alcohol and other addictive substances played in their life. And here's the most heartbreaking thing. Because they were such slaves to it, many of them wouldn't admit that it was ever a problem. And it destroyed their life. Listen, alcohol makes a terrible master and it charges you way too much to be its slave. Get free from it, it's not worth it. Next thing he says, they can't be greedy for dishonest gain. Meaning if a person is a lover of money or a hoarder of money, if they're somebody that's not generous or who handles their money just poorly, then they can't serve as a deacon. Why? Because they can't be trusted, right? You look at a person's character and integrity to see how they would be. If they can't handle themselves, how can they handle others, right? This is very simple. He says they do need to hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. So this is kind of confusing. I'm going to try to just make this clear for you. It means that they need to be sound or solid in their faith and in their life. That's what this means. As servant leaders supporting the elders and ministering often directly with the people, deacons should not be people who are easily swayed by false teaching. They should be people who know and believe the true gospel as the scripture teaches it. Now, you'll remember why Paul brought this up. One, I mean, it's really obvious, right? Can you imagine if deacons in the church were just like easily believing like false doctrine and they're just out there on the ground doing work? Remember, Paul's writing this letter to Timothy and Timothy is combating false teaching that is happening in his church in Ephesus. And so it makes sense that Paul's telling him, listen, your lead servants should not be people who are easily swayed by false teachers and false doctrine. He's like, they need to be great. They need to be solid. They need to hold to the faith. Also, he says the deacon's life must be lived in support of their doctrine. Like that's, that, this is really, really important. They need to be people who practice and live out what they preach, What do we call somebody who doesn't practice or live out what they preach? We call them hypocrites, right? Now it's easy because we're all hypocrites to some degree. There's a moment in every day of our sinful lives where we're hypocrites to some degree. Thanks be to God for Jesus, right? Thanks be to God for Jesus. Paul says next that they need to be blameless. This is is an interesting one. This means, family, that a deacon or a leader should be somebody who is well-known in the church, well-known among the elders, and should not be somebody who can easily have doubts or suspicion cast upon their life, okay? Now, at risk of re-preaching Pastor Eric's phenomenal sermon from last Sunday, I just want to echo some of the things he said, okay? Of course, no one is above correction in their life. Nobody is above correction in their walk with Jesus. Nobody is without sin in their life. Okay, there's nobody that's perfect. But leaders in particular should be striving to live in such a way that if accusations are hurled towards them, they're very difficult for people to believe. It's hard, it would be hard for people to believe that that was true. They should be living in such a way that they have integrity. Okay, that's what this means. It matters. Nobody's perfect, but it matters that they're on that trajectory. Okay. Now in verse 11, uh, this is really interesting. Paul kind of, he just kind of going through this thing. And then in verse 11, he starts with two words. He says, their wives. And he begins to speak of the, the, their wives as if to speak about the character and integrity of a male deacon's wife. Now, this one's interesting because we need to look closely for a second because the misunderstanding and misinterpretation of this verse actually very easily leads some people to think that the office of deacon is reserved only for men along with the office of elder. But here are two reasons why I don't think that that's true. Okay, number one, there was something done in the English translation here that I think can be misleading, all right? Uh, What you need to know, if you look at the beginning of verse 11, is that the pronoun there that's used right there, T-H-E-I-R, 
does not exist in the original Greek language of this text. There is no Greek word for the pronoun there. When it was translated from Greek to English, it was added by translators in good faith, uh, perhaps for grammatical correctness, or, or even the reality that maybe some translators felt that it was implied, and they should, they should just put that word there. Uh, I'm actually, I'm not sure on that. I don't think that that's actually correct. And not only that, but number two, you need to know that the word there in verse 11 for wives, the word for wives and women is actually the same word in the Greek language. It's the word hini, okay? And it can be used either way, wives or women. And so having said that, considering those two things alone, it's actually more accurate that from the original Greek, verse 11 would read like this, women likewise, who also serve as deacons, must be dignified, not slanderers, sober-minded, faithful in all things, okay? Now, those reasons, plus one more, I said two, I'm going to give you three, plus the reality that we actually see female deacons named in the Bible and celebrated by the apostles, (laughs) should have started with that one lets us confidently say and believe that women can, should, and do serve in the high-level office of deacon in a church. In fact, I want you to know something. Most of the deacons here at Living Stones are women. Most of them. That's what I'm I'm saying it. I just don't want to say woo because then my voice would squeak and I'd never live it down. (laughs) Most of our deacons here are women. These are powerful, strong, gifted women who serve in high capacities here. And these women are a major reason we exist as a church family. Like so many times, this is not in my notes. So many times I'm like, where are the men at? So I'll just say it. Hey men, where are you at? (laughs) We would love to have you get up and join this thing with us. And I'm not putting you down. I'm calling you. Where are you? The women are, oh, but we're working, Pastor Nathan. So are the women, bro. And they're also taking care of your kids. And they're still here. Another sermon. Where are you at, man? (laughs) Let's go. We need you. Shifting gears. Right after verse 11, he then says, the husband of one wife. So he's going back now. It's a new thought. Even in the Greek, it's a new thought. So he's coming back and he's saying, if the deacon is a man, Paul says, He needs to be a one-woman man, right? This echoes Pastor Eric's explanation from last Sunday in regards to elders. He's to be faithful to his spouse. He's not somebody who can be messing around physically or emotionally with another woman. This is not a woman who is messing around physically or emotionally or digitally or anything with another man. No messing around, whether it's in person, online, chatting, texting, or even with a 2D image on a screen that you don't think's hurting anybody else. Faithfulness is the call. We must be faithful. And hey, I have really good news for you. I know that the majority of us, including myself, not just in in these relational areas or lust areas, we're all unfaithful people. But I have really good news for you. You wanna know something about our God? He is faithful. And the Bible says that we can come to him at any point And when we confess our unfaithfulness, it says he is faithful and just to forgive us. And so nobody should feel condemned, not when you're looking at Jesus. Okay. The next thing he says is they need to manage their children and household well. A deacon or just a leader in the church needs to be the spiritual leader of their families protecting and pointing their children to Christ to the best of their ability, praying daily that God would save them and draw them to himself. And listen, I want you to remember on this one, the call is not to perfection, it's to faithfulness. If the one thing I talk to people about, especially moms, the one thing they say is, I just feel like I'm failing as a parent. I've heard people say, I just feel like I'm messing up my kids. I've felt that so much before. My kids are hard. They push you, they test you. I've felt that, I've lived in that. But guess what, family? For all of our imperfections, our God is faithful and perfect. For all of our failures, he covers them in amazing grace and gives us the gift of the spirit of God to step forward, to make changes and to pursue what's right and good. If it wasn't for this family, the church simply wouldn't have any leaders. We just wouldn't exist. 
But God is calling us to faithfulness and to humility, not to perfection. Again, why are all these qualifications so important? It's because the credibility of a church family in large part is determined by the character and integrity of its leadership. And when our church community and its leadership has integrity, then our message has power. We can then speak with authenticity to a chaotic and mistrusting world. Look, knowing that the gospel, the news of Christ's life, death, and resurrection is the only hope for our world. It should mean that we as Christians and leaders should then be striving to do whatever we can to ensure that this message goes out in power. Amen? Like this is the only hope. There is no hope outside of Jesus for our world. There is nowhere to look to anchor yourself in anything that's real in this world. We must look to Jesus. Our community must look to Jesus. And God sent you to tell them that. He didn't just send me. I'll start to close with this. Uh, Brennan Manning said this, and although I don't think it's as cut and dry as he claims, it's certainly worth considering, but I'll put it on the screen. He said, the, sing- the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door, and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. See, family, when we display the fruit of what we preach, then the world looks in and sees its authenticity. It sees a transformed and transforming presence. And then the door opens even a little bit wider for us to tell them about Jesus Christ, to tell them that we as followers of Christ, leaders or not, are not perfect. We all rely on the perfect sinless life of Christ lived in place of our sinful ones. We all rely on and rejoice in the shed blood of Christ on the cross that washes us clean from our sin. We all rejoice in the resurrection of Christ from the dead. And we're rejoicing and holding on to the fact that one day we will join him in heaven and live forever with him. We will live forever, family, in the place where sin and death are no more, where tears are wiped away, where everything is as it should be. That's coming for us. Jesus is our everything. He's the only hope for the world. And so church, by God's grace, when people look at living stones, they will see imperfect men and women, yes. But hopefully they see imperfect men and women with their eyes on Jesus. Humbly striving every day to turn from sin and to bring him glory. Finally, church, would you please pray, continue to pray for me, for your pastors, for your leaders here? We need it. We need it badly. The enemy is out to destroy us, to disqualify us, to tear apart our families, to rob us of our unity, to ruin our witness for Christ. Pray for strength for us as we pray daily for you. The devil is smart. He's patient. He prowls around like a roaring lion, the scripture says, seeking somebody to devour. I love how Pastor Seth says, the devil's prowling around, not looking for somebody he can give a bad day to. He's looking for somebody to devour, to ruin your life, to destroy you. We all need the strength and grace of God. We as elders need the strength and grace of God to protect and preserve us so that the gospel may go out in powerful ways and that it may bring salvation to all who hear. Amen, family? Amen. God, we love you and we're so thankful for who you are. I know myself and the other elders here are so thankful that the call is not perfection, but just to walk with you. God, would you please forgive us for all of our failure? Would you please forgive us for the times We've been inauthentic when we've been hypocritical. God, we just, would you just remind us of your precious son's blood that flows down a cross so that we could not be uh, dirty and destroyed, but washed white as snow and made righteous. God, thank you for that truth for everyone in this room who calls you Lord and Savior. God, my hope and prayer is that living... 
Living Stones Church in Elko, Nevada is here far after I'm gone. But God, it won't happen if men and women aren't men and women of integrity. It won't happen if I'm not. So God, will you please give us your amazing grace? We love you. We are so thankful for the gospel. We cannot wait to celebrate the baptism of so many people next Sunday who are not ashamed of the gospel. Thank you for what you're doing in our church and in our lives. We love you. We surrender all to you. And we do this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Each week as a church, we take some time to confess sin that maybe we've been convicted of uh, as we've heard God's word spoken over us. And today we saw that the credibility of our church is dependent on the character and integrity of our leaders as well as the rest of us and how we follow Jesus and live our lives day to day. And so today I think we should take some time to confess our sin of living in a way that does not show the world, the beauty of Jesus. Today, I'd like us to confess the sin of proclaiming with our mouths the truth that Jesus saves, but denying him by the way that we live every day. So let's take the next few moments and just dedicate it to confessing that sin of not living out what we confess with our mouths. Let's do that now. Church, the good news is that even when we fail to be a good witness, even when we miserably fail showing the world the truth through the way that we live our lives, for those who trust in Jesus and for those who confess their sins to him, scripture is explicit. We are forgiven. Amen. That's the best news that anyone can hear. You have failed more than you can imagine, but God's grace is more incredible and more powerful than your sin and anything else that you can imagine. And so today, like every week, we're gonna celebrate communion together because we need to remember through the taking of the juice that represents Jesus's bloodshed and the bread representing his body broken, we need to remember his grace. We need to remember the forgiveness that he offers us. We need to remember that he is coming again for us. And so we will never stop taking communion week after week after week until he comes back for us. Amen. So in a few moments, uh, our, our servants are going to pass around those plates. For those of you and your family who lead your family, this would be a great opportunity for you to remind your wife, your kids, before they take the meal, this represents Jesus' blood shed for you. This represents his body broken. Lead your family during this time if you can. What a great opportunity to point them towards Jesus as they remember. And if you're here today and you're just exploring this whole faith thing, kind of checking in and looking at what it looks like to follow Jesus, I wanna free you from taking part in this religious activity. The ultimate uh, reality is that the people who are taking these elements and drinking them and eating them, they trust in Jesus for their salvation. They're saying through the taking of this meal that all of their chips are in that basket. Everything is right there. If you're not ready to say that yet, it's okay. You can come to Living Stones as long as you want. You can explore faith as long as you want, but I'd recommend that you not take this meal at this time. There'll be a prayer on the screen behind me. I'd encourage you to read that prayer and maybe see if you connect with God for the very first time. We believe that anybody who cries out the name of Jesus, God will respond to. We believe that wholeheartedly. Now, for those of you Christians that are about to take this meal, while those around you who are maybe exploring or praying and maybe seeking God's face for the first time, this would be a great opportunity for you to confess any other sin that you've got, for you to prepare your hearts to come to the table and rejoice in what Jesus has done. This isn't a somber moment. This is an incredible celebration of the goodness of the gospel. Amen. All right, I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to receive communion together. So would you guys bow your heads with me? Father, we thank you for this weekly reminder of your grace. 
God, I ask that for each one of us, we would consider what our lives look like. We would confess any sin before we come to this table so that we can say that when we come here, we're truly rejoicing. We're not sad. We're not broken, God. We're rejoicing in the victory that you have over sin and death. God, be with us as we take this meal together. God, unite our family further under the banner of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Family, let's take communion together. So each month, for the sake of transparency, uh, we like to give you a quick snapshot of how our church is doing financially. It's called a budget update. Get fired up, right? It's the best part of our service. There it was. Uh, if you're new here and this seems like a really weird thing to you, I totally understand. Uh, but I want you to consider this. There are people here who faithfully and sacrificially give to see the gospel go out here in Elko uh, and elsewhere. And all we want to do is honor them by letting them know how we're doing with that. Uh, and, and this month, to be honest with you, there's incredible news to celebrate. And so if you would put that first slide up, I love charts. I love graphs. They tell me a lot of good stuff. But what you guys should see here is that for the last two months, our church has been incredibly faithful and incredibly generous to the mission of God. Would you guys give yourselves a hand? Two months running, we have uh, outdone our expected giving. And what that does is that makes sure that we can keep all of the commitments to church planning efforts that we have as a church. It means that we can meet all of our commitments to the various benevolence opportunities that we have in our community. It means that we can keep uh, the lights on, just being honest. It means that we can keep staff here helping to organize volunteers and make sure that week after week, when new people come in, they're greeted well. They're invited into a hospitable family. You guys are doing that through your financial generosity. 
And, and this is a special budget update because of what's coming at the end of this month. And that's something that we want to start letting you know about here. Every single year, we partner with Living Water International for what we call our year-end gift. This is an opportunity for our church to truly reach far outside of the borders that we've got around us now to really impact the world for good. This is an opportunity to drill fresh, clean drinking water wells in developing countries around the world, as well as support church planning efforts and the spreading of the gospel both here and abroad. So every year, what we ask is that you consider what you will give above and beyond what you normally give to Living Stones Church to bless someone else. What we like to say here is that we spend less on ourselves so that we can be more generous towards others in the Christmas season. And I want to encourage you now to start thinking about this. On November 27th, which is the last Sunday of this month, we are gonna open up the year-end gift. And our goal is simply to just do what we did last year. And that's to raise $70,000, 50% of which will go to drill wells and 50% of which will go to local outreach and church planning efforts. This is an incredible opportunity for our church. To give you a quick idea of what last year looked like, we asked for 40 grand. That's what we asked for. And you guys raised $70,000. That's seven wells. That's seven communities. That's up to 30,000 people who actually have access to clean and safe drinking water because of what you've done. That's like the city of Elko. If that, that ever can, like entered your brain, that you have provided both the gospel and clean drinking water to communities who are plagued with waterborne illnesses. Thank God for you guys. Thank God for your generosity last year. We're just asking you to do the same this year, to be thinking forward, to be considerate of how you will spend less on yourselves and provide life to those in need. Amen. In a few minutes, we're going to receive our offering here at Living Stones. This is an opportunity for you to worship God with what he has given you. Uh, my hope and prayer for our church is always that we'll consider what it looks like to be faithful and sacrificial as we provide uh, and build together the kingdom of God. This is our chance to participate in the work that God is doing in a powerful way. Uh, I pray that you give joyfully, and I pray that you give thoughtfully and prayerfully as well. Uh, I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to receive our offering. The digital methods are on the screen behind me. If you'd rather give that way instead of with cash or a check, no way is more holy, I promise. It's all the same thing. Uh, so let's pray for our offering, and then let's receive it. God, we thank you. First, God, I thank you for the generosity of our church. Man, I thank you that you have, you have given living stones a people who just loves to see the gospel preached who loves to see lives change, who loves to see uh, people blessed, clean water going out to those people. God, we just ask that you would continue to do this work in our church. God, may we not just be marked by as people of the gospel, but a giving, a giving and generous people. God, let our community see this. Let the world see this, that pe the people of God are not selfish. They are not just about themselves. They want to see truly amazing things happen. God, give each one of us that vision in our own hearts so that we cannot let anything control us except for the truth that Jesus loves us and Jesus is saving us. God, I ask for your blessing on this offering. God, would you be with each heart that gives today? God, would you remind it to give joyfully and prayerfully? God, be with us as we give today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's receive our offering. As we look around uh, in our world, we see that our world is broken. It needs hope. And Pastor Nathan so clearly stated today that we have hope in Jesus, that he's worthy of our praise, of our prayers, of our worship. And that's what this, uh, these next two songs remind us of. And so would you please stand as we sing. Shadows deepen 
Amen, church. Amen, 
Thank you guys so much for coming out and worshiping today. It has been incredible. A couple of things before you go. The first of that is there will be leaders and pastors and deacons up front to pray with you if you want prayer today. A quick couple of housekeeping things. We've got starting point at 1245 today after the 11 a.m. service. If you're new or visiting, I would highly recommend you come to that. Find more about Living Stones. And last, if you guys have children, before you get prayer, before you hang out and chat, would you guys grab them? Uh, our teachers are struggling to reset set those classrooms in between services and we really need your help uh, to get those kids out so that they can prepare for the next kids that are coming in. Our church is getting big fam. Uh, praise God for that. But also we got to do our part to just keep that going. But before you leave, a missional sending, something to take with you as you guys go out. As we go out, let's live outward and show the world who our Jesus is by our actions. May they see the beauty of Jesus Christ. And in benediction, which is ascending prayer, may you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. And all God's people said, amen. You guys are dismissed. Have a wonderful week. It was awesome.